live, love, laugh, learn, and lighten the heck up. <laughs> and what that means is you're on this planet to live. You're not here to, and live doesn't mean sitting down watching television, or as I call it, the electronic income reducer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, live means get out and live your life. You only got one of them. Move your body, interact with other people, do things, do things. You know, from the very question, the first question that you asked me about the book and what I learned in the book was to do. You know, don't just learn, don't just sit and do, you do something, interact. So live your life. Love, we already talked about that. Love yourself, love as many people as you possibly can. It's what we're here for. Love is happiness. It's, it, it's what makes us human beings, us human beings. It's what we're all after. Find a way to do as much of it as you possibly can. Laugh for all of the right reasons. Meaning, when we laugh, we're healthier, <laughs> you know, we're happier. It, it makes the blood flow, we breathe better and all those things. Laugh as much as possible. You know, create the energy, we attract more and all those things. Um, Learn, always be a student. To this day, I still spend you know, a lot of money on seminars and workshops and books and, and recordings and things like that. Because learning is, the, the day you stop learning is the day you start going the other direction. You know? And learning, again, does not mean sitting in front of the television and watching a sitcom or some other you know, show. I'm not knocking them, but be, you know, use it in moderation. Learn stuff. You should be learning something every day. At the end of the day, you should say, what did I learn? And you should go back over it. You should, you should go back and go, well, this is what I learned. The, the mind is the most unbelievable computer and it's got endless storage. Um, well, first off, I think it's just the opposite. I, I think if you poll, and I have polled, and, and most of my friends and people that I know that are successful or have accomplished a lot, have, have gone through a lot of struggles and oftentimes come through uh, times that were insurmountable, if you will. And there are several books that are written about it. I remember reading one not too long ago, forgive me, I don't remember the title, but it was about the amount of people who became successful as a result of having been fired from a job. <laughs> and at the time, they thought it was the, the, uh, the bottom. And for myself, I, um, I grew up in middle class, you know, my, I had a great family and great parents and everything, but when I was 18 years old, three grown men tried to take my life because of the color of my skin. And it, uh, it robbed me of my confidence and my self-esteem and my self-worth. And I wound up homeless. I, lived, um, I live in Los Angeles now, but I lived in a place not too far from here uh, called Lancaster. And I, I lived in a cardboard box. And what changed it for me was, was uh, somebody gave me a book. And it was somebody that I didn't know. It was a kind person that... Uh, gave me this book, and the book was called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. <laughs> Greatest book ever. And uh, I was, you know, 18 years old and, and didn't want to read it, but he almost forced me to read it, and I begrudgingly read it. And when I read it, it changed everything. It changed how I thought about myself, and I recognized that I could, uh, I could change myself, how I thought, how I felt about myself, and, and how I viewed the world around me. And, um, and I, I did some of the fundamentals in the book, which two things happened. Number one, doing, doing them, my life changed, I changed and I started to produce more, but it also made me recognize that it wasn't just the knowledge. And I remember thinking this at the time, David, that it wasn't just what was in that book, it's what I did. And when I went back to that person to thank him and to tell him, you know, to ask him what I could do for him, what he said for, to me was, what you do for me is what I've done for you. He said, you help as many people as you possibly can change their lives. And at first, I didn't honestly, I didn't take it seriously. But as I, I grew and, and started to recognize, that's my calling, and that's what I love to do, and that's why I do what I do now. As a matter of fact, I was in survival mode, so I just wanted to, to have a roof over my head and, and have a girlfriend, <laughs> you know, and, and have have some fundamentals. And um, but I, my dream back then was I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be a professional musician. I wanted to make records. I wanted to, you know, do all that stuff. And uh, so that, you know, I, I got a job. I started working. I started doing things. And that was what I pursued for many, many years. And, and uh, using those principles, you know, got my, my, made my way into the music world and started doing that first. And then uh, I got a recording deal in uh, 1990. 
1990. Yeah, in 1990. Uh, and the record company, uh, you know, they gave us the money, they started to produce the record and everything, and then the record company changed hands. They sold to, to another uh, uh, company, and I got, uh, my, my person that represented me left the company, and I got, um, so I was stuck in there and I couldn't make music because the contract wouldn't let me do it. So that's when I decided, you know, well, I've got to do something else, and that's when I started doing what I do now. Because I, all, all along, I had been working with a couple of my mentors, as you know, Tony Robbins, and and, uh, and teaching a little bit and learning a lot. And I just started uh, doing this and wrote my first book, and uh, that became very successful. And then, just what was teaching. your first book? My first book was it was called Unlimited Power. Of yeah, but we, yeah, yeah, and uh, it was a bestseller back in '96. <laughs> yeah, way, way long time ago. And, uh, and then from there, uh, I started enjoying, uh, uh, well, well, first, I, I also got a degree in psychology. Uh, and I opened a practice in Los Angeles, seeing every known weirdo you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and I say that jokingly, because uh, uh, people have challenges all over the place. And I became very proficient in helping people get over fears and phobias and emotional challenges and, and uh, those type of, uh, of things. And a lot, again, I was working with, with Tony at the same time as well. And, uh, and I started to recognize, well, gosh, one-on-one -on -one is great and I still love to do that, but to reach more people, I needed to have larger audiences. And uh, so I wrote some more books and started doing more of that. And that's kind of what I do now. Yes. Um, that's a great question. I, I'm, if I was to be honest with you, I, I, and I hope this doesn't sound too noble, um, it's because I care. It's because I care. I, I do have technique, uh, and I think that's important, but I think what's more important is to care about your audience. You know, we are just now, I'm creating a, a speaker's uh, 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 performance uh, uh, school, if you will, to teach people to seek or teach people to speak and to present and that type of thing and teach some of the techniques that are not out there. And I've, I've had some great mentors uh, that, I, that have taught me and that I've learned from and observed. Uh, but I think the answer to your question is because I, I really do, I love people and, and, I, and I care about my audience and, and that makes the biggest difference. That with the technique makes the biggest difference. Again, I've had lots of mentors and uh, some of my mentors were not even speakers. Some of my mentors were, uh, were humorous uh, people. I, I really like David Letterman, I like uh, Eddie Murphy, <laughs> uh, but I also uh, like Martin Luther King and one of my mentors, uh, Anthony Robbins, and, and several other speakers around. And, I, and I, I think to answer your question, who I became is a conglomeration of who, who I brought to the table, meaning all my years of being a musician and, and who I, I, I believe I am, as well as some of the traits that I borrowed from other people. But I think probably, uh, again, I have to go back to, um, it, it, um, I, I've got to look at, there are specific things. I always tell people when I'm speaking, because I, I like to give everything away. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want there to be any secrets. I, and, and I'll tell people, watch what I do. Watch what I say. Watch, everything that I do from, from the time that I start to the time that I finish has a reason and a purpose, and you can see it, and I'll, and I'll share it with you. And when people watch it, because that's what I did. I, I watched, and I had people teach me, but then all the way back to Think and Grow Rich, it's what you do, it's what you practice, it's what you rehearse that'll produce yourself. I didn't have fears of not succeeding, but I had, believe it or not, an extreme fear of rejection or what some might call stage fright, believe it or not. <laughs> um, I didn't like to call it that at the time, but I just get so nervous before I go on stage. And now? Now I fall asleep before I go on stage, literally. Um, <laughs> but it's because of something, I, I believe in, even if, whenever I speak, if anybody has ever, you know, if I've had the privilege of speaking with, with somebody, they know that I'm not going to just give a speech. They know that I'm not just going to t uh, help them feel good. I'm going to teach them to do something because that's so, so important. And so using a technique, I ridded myself of, of the fear uh, uh, of rejection, ridded myself of stage fright, and replaced it with relaxation and calmness to the point that before I go on stage, literally I'm yawning. And it's a technique that's it's, it's simple, not necessarily easy, and if you practice it, if you do it, it just works. And that, I gotta be honest with you, allows me to be spontaneous and fun and, and relaxed and, 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 and be able to go anywhere I want on stage because I'm not worried about anything or I'm not, I'm not stressed.
um, I have, again, I keep going back to this, I have a system. And I have a format or an outline that, um, that I can prepare in minutes, if not seconds. This happens to me sometimes. I'll go somewhere and I'll be in the audience of, of somewhere and somebody will go, hey, Joseph is here. Joseph, come up here and say a few words. And from the time that I leave the seat to the time that I hit the podium, I can put together what I'm going to say because I have a system uh, to do that. Uh, but the long answer to your, to your question, um, in terms of preparing, there is a before, during, and after of any presentation. I don't like to look at it as, as a speech, because speech is just that, you're just talking. I believe that a presentation, you're, you're going to connect with your audience mm. through caring, through love, through, uh, and, in, and then you're going to also deliver content, but then you're going to touch them in an emotional place that makes them not just want to do something, but thrive on going and doing something, because that's, that's where the change is made. It's not just listening. Uh, so I put all my components, I put all my, I, I put a, a beginning to the presentation, a middle, and then an ending all together. I have a little outline that I go through and I put it all in there. And then that way I don't have to rely on a script. I don't have to rely on a, uh, uh, a preset thing and they're all different. It makes it fun for me and it gets to be spontaneous. So, uh, but then way before all of that, well, first off, that is what I do at home uh, or before I go on, uh, before I, as I'm, as I'm manufacturing the presentation. But before I go on stage, there are things that I say to myself and there are certain ways that I move my body and, uh, and that I feel and then I just relax. You know? and, and because of what I said before, uh, that I, uh, I worked on myself, to, to be able to uh, be calm, um, that kicks in automatically. I don't have to make myself that way, it kicks in automatically. And then I prepare myself, say a few things, and rock and roll. Here's what I would say, the simple answer is, the reason that they don't succeed is because they don't apply what they learned, you know. We, we've all heard the, the saying that knowledge is not power, and it's true. Knowledge is just potential power. There's knowledge in books, there's knowledge, you know, somebody told me that, that and I, I believe this, that 80% of all of the knowledge of, since the dawn of time is on the internet somewhere. You know, if you want to know how many stitches there are in a soccer ball, you can look it up and th that information is there. Uh, and the how-to information, and the how-to books, you know, it's, it's called shelf help. You know, instead of self-help, people get the book and they put it on their shelf and they, and they may read it, but they don't do what's in the book. I, I think the biggest difference uh, in why people don't and why people do is in the actual activity that they do with the knowledge. I always say that knowledge is stored information. Wisdom is knowledge that is acted upon. It's applied knowledge. So if you learn something, then do something about it. And the best books for me, and, and that's the way it was in Think and Grow Rich, and every single book that I write, and every single uh, presentation that I do, I'm gonna have people do something in the moment, and then I'm gonna give you something to do after, after so you get a result. And, and in Think and Grow Rich, that was in, in that book, it said, do this, 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 and this. And that's what I did. And, and as soon as I did, I felt better, and things started to change. If that's what the instruction is, you see, it's called discipline. And discipline, to me, means doing the prescribed activity as prescribed, even if it's difficult, no matter what. I'll repeat myself. Doing the prescribed activity as prescribed, even and especially if it's difficult, no matter what. That means if it says to lift that weight 50 times, then and then rest for 10 minutes and then lift it another 50 times then you do it and when it's you know repetition number 20 and it's hard to do the instruction said to do it 50 times do it 50 times no matter what and and activity means don't just do it once do it how many times it said to do it and so and, and again to, to me that's the answer to your question and, and it's it maybe a uh, it, it's a two-part answer the reason why more people aren't successful, for lack of a better term, is because they don't do what they know, what they've learned. But, this, but the underlying uh, question is, why don't they do what they know? Yeah. 
And that answer is multifaceted because people are multifaceted. People may feel like they can't. People may feel tired. People may not have the energy. People may feel like because something they, somebody said to them when they were 10 years old bothers them. People may have fear of failure, fear of success. There's a whole lot of uh, different reasons. But all of those reasons can be dealt with. Very, uh, and I always say there's a difference between simplicity and ease. I'm not saying that things are easy, but they're easier than, than the school of hard knocks to, to do it once or twice or to do it in the very beginning to get that stuff out of the way. So it's, life is much simpler than we've been led to believe. If you, if you do the simple things now, then it's going to be easier for you later. Uh, you know, it is my, it, it, it is probably, I, 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 it's a toss up for me between um, what is more important, the, the personal development side, teaching that, or teaching people the health and wellness, because they're both important. However, I will say that if you don't have your health, you're not gonna perform as well over here. If you, if you have diminished health, then you're gonna have diminished energy, and all kinds of things are gonna be a result of that, but just from a basic format, if we're looking at, at uh, the, the, the ability to go further, faster, your, your health, your wellness is a direct link to that. So I would say that you have gotta have this foundation, but most people don't wanna hear that. Most people wanna hear, how do I make more money? How do I get you know, you know, a better relationship? How do I get a better car? How do I do all that stuff now? And they'll you know, drive themselves crazy, staying up late and doing all kinds, and, and they'll run their health down trying to get here. And the, the old saying is some people pick the fruit and some people study the root. I say, pick the fruit and eat it while you study the root. Do them both at the same time. <laughs> you know, let's get healthy while you do the other. I'm not saying you gotta, you know, stop your goals and everything and get healthy right now. I'm saying let's do it all at the same time. And you'll, you'll move further faster. Well, there are exceptions to the rule. However, there are no exceptions in the end. And I'll give you an example, uh, Bill Gates. He was, he was uh, all, you know, for many, many years, I remember hearing about him that he lived on junk food and, and all that stuff, and, and his health suffered. In the end, it, it, it took his life. And I know a lot of people, that, and I'm not saying that, and, and as I said, there are exceptions. There are people that can smoke cigarettes into their, into their hundreds and never get sick, but the majority, the vast, vast majority of people are not gonna be able to do that. Um, and my belief is um, that what we need to do is to take a look at how we cause ourselves to function at our optimum. If you got a Ferrari, you don't put water in the gas tank. You know, you put the best gasoline you possibly can in. Why? Because that car was designed to run on the best gasoline. This body that we have is designed to run on the best food. And you can put other food into it, and it's still going to run, but it's not going to run as well. And so, uh, um, I, I think that in this day and age, it's absurd for people to go, oh, wait a minute, I'll just eat junk food and expect the best. You know, it's absurd. And, and it's, it, it's, it's logical to say that I can eat junk food or not eat so well and not take care of myself and I can still succeed. Yes, you can do that, but it's gonna be harder. And, and first off, I, I, I wanna point out that I don't, I believe it's not just the food. There are eight principles. It's the air we breathe. I, I call these the eight pillars of, of health and wellness. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the thoughts we think, the moves we make, the words we speak, the things we seek, the, uh, uh, the sleep we take, and the thoughts we think. And, and, and what happens is when you, put, when you change any one of those things, then it changes everything. It changes, it, it, it just a, a little shift in one of those areas will change everything. So food is just one portion of it. It's just, it's just, uh, it, it's a big portion of it. But the most important thing is the air we breathe. Try to stop breathing. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the reality is, is in, in, in one of our workshops, I teach people how to breathe. Most people don't. People don't, it, we think, well, God, I breathe all the time. But most people, in, in my opinion, about 80% of the people out there are getting two thirds and maybe even half of the oxygen that they can get, and it's the most important things. Your cells need it, you need it for energy, you need it for all that stuff. They're, on, they're breathing in such a way that they're getting half 
they're getting a quarter, I'm sorry, a third to half less oxygen than their body can, uh, should be having. And if you just change that one thing, change how they breathe, their head gets clearer, they think better, they have more energy. Yeah. I, I guess I can. One of the well, I uh, watch this, okay. And, yeah. and if you, I think you 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 saw me uh, at uh, at one of the workshops, so you may be different. Yeah. Take a deep breath right now. No. Yeah, right now. One more. Okay, so you're actually better than most, okay? Because here's what most people do. And, and again, I'm not going to assume that because you saw me do this at the at the health yeah. seminar. Uh, this is the reason why, but you're breathing better than most. But here's how most people breathe. I'm going to exaggerate a little bit. Most people, when I say take a deep breath, they go like this. Yeah. Okay. And they breathe up here. But our lungs are shaped like this. They're bigger on the bottom. They're narrow at the top. And what happens is when people breathe like that, chest comes up, shoulders, shoulders come up, chest comes out, head comes back, and their stomach goes in. It's the, absolute, it's the optimum of the way that the lungs are supposed to work. The stomach should come out when we breathe. And yours is, by the way, a little bit, you know, when you're doing that. And it's because we're filling up the bottom of our lungs first, and it's our diaphragm that pulls down that makes air come in. When most people are breathing, they're going, and they're pushing their diaphragm in, which is cutting off the bottom third of their lungs. And they're not getting the oxygen they need. And it's the most important thing that we do. You'll see people, they're tired all the time. If I just show people how to breathe and then teach them the process of doing it how X amount of times a day, then, then it won't take very long before they get used to it because they feel good and their body will adapt to doing it better. So we call it deep diaphragmic breathing versus stress breathing up top. Breathe in, it, you know, a, a simple way of saying it is breathe into your stomach. You know, people just go, well, it's not where my stomach it is, but yeah, but if we, it, it, you know, I don't breathe air into it, but if you allow yourself to do it, then your stomach has to come out because it displaces your intestine and your, your guts and all that stuff to, to, for your diaphragm to come down. That's the way we're supposed to. Watch a baby sleep or watch any human being sleep. When we lay down, that's the way our creator made us so that when, we, when we're laying prone, when we're laying out, we have to breathe that way. And that's the most creative time. That's the time that our body is rejuvenating itself and all those things. The exercise that I have people do is, is to breathe a certain way. You know, I always tell people, get your cell phone, and every time it goes off, stop and take deep, 10 deep diaphragmic breaths. Do it, and reset it for another hour, and then, and then do it again. Then pretty soon, you'll find yourself breathing that way normally. But you got to do it. Hmm. It becomes an unconscious habit. Anything that's repeated is going to become a habit. Well, it's not so much a suggestion as much as as a result of doing several other things a certain way or a different way than most of us are normal. Your sleep will change. I sleep about four and a half, maybe five hours a night, and I've slept that way for 25 years now. And uh, I wake up energized and excited and, and, and uh, alert, and I go right to sleep. I have no sleeping problems at all. I sleep on airplanes. The long, I was telling this to some of you the other day, the longest <laughs> I sleep these days is when I get on an airplane. I can get on an airplane and fly to France, and I'll sleep from the time I leave Los Angeles to the time I, leave, I land in Charles de Gaulle, <laughs> straight. straight through. So I can sleep as long as I want to, but I don't have to. You know, I wake up every morning with no alarm clock, eyes wide open. quick answer is, first, it's always three things. Number one, know what you want. That's the number one thing. And, and I'll give you an example. People come to me all, you know, I've, I've done this for many, many years, help people get over fears and phobias and that kind of thing. And traditionally, I'll ask somebody, well, what do you want? And they'll go, I don't want to be afraid of dogs anymore. And I'll say, okay, well, what do you want? And they go, I'm afraid of dogs, and I don't want to be afraid of dogs anymore. And I'll go, okay, well, great. What do you want? And they go, I want to lose my fear of dogs. And I'll go, okay, well, great, what do you want? And they'll go, I'm telling you. And I'll go, no, you're telling me what you don't want. Because I know, because they're going, fear of dogs, fear of dogs, fear of dogs, they're, they, they're telling me what they don't want. So if I get them to the point that I go, what do you really want? And they go, I want to be able to hold a puppy and, and, and feel excited about it. Then three things happen. Number one, I know I'm pointing them in the right direction and I can give them what they want, not what I say they want. And they feel it, which is number two. And then number three, they experience what they want and I can capture that. You know, I always, it's not a joke, I always tell people, if you got a fear of dogs, guess what's gonna be in my office when you come there? 
a dog. You got a fear of heights, we're going to go up skydiving. You got a fear of, uh, of closed places, we're going to go in an elevator. And the reason being is because I need to, you know, I, I, I practice something called the neurosciences. And versus taking your time and stretching it out through time, people, and, and you know, I've worked with a lot of people who've been in front of other therapists and been with other therapists for years and years and years and haven't gotten the result. So number one, help them figure out what they want. Number two, help them figure out what it is that stops them. And it's not the dog. If it's, it's, if you say it's a fear of dogs, it's not. It's the thought of the dog. It's not the dog. Because those people are horrified when there's no dogs around. They, they spend their lives, and I'm just using dogs as an example, uh, sheltering themselves and keeping themselves away from dogs. So, so is it the fear of dogs? Or is it the dog? No, it's the thought of the dog. And as soon as I can get people to recognize it's themselves that are doing it to them, not the dog, then that's step number two. Help figure out what's stopping them. And then number three is to bust o open that thought and emotional pattern, meaning help them, while they're in it, get away from it. We call it a pattern interrupt. Um, be because if I interrupt somebody when they're doing anything, they're no longer where they were. You know, if I go, right now you and I are talking and an explosion happens over there, guess what, we're, we're, our, our focus is over there, but we're not in this conversation. But that's a very valuable moment because while we're going, what's going on over here? We're very curious, we're open. And so, and, which is the, the fourth step, is that in, in to put into that place what they want. So to take from the very beginning and to put it in there. I'm giving you the broad strokes, put that in that place. And then the next step is to condition it and do it over and over again to make it so that that is the, the, the place that the, the nervous system defaults to. And do it over and over again, condition it, till pretty soon they're no longer it. If somebody comes in and they got a fear of dogs, and in, in less than an hour's time they're going to be holding a puppy. A thousand different times, a thousand different ways, you know. Um, I mean, I've done, I'm, I'm you have an example, for example? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw a glass of water in somebody's face or yell at them or, or you know, have somebody else walk in or set off a... I used to have this thing, still have it, that is a, uh, it's a can of air with a horn on it that's sitting underneath my desk. And all I have to do is push that and all of a sudden that's going to interrupt their pattern. Anything. I'll jump up, I'll grab them, shake them around. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm spontaneous. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do anything. Well, the easy answer is is to have them experience what they what they experienced in the very beginning. In other words, when I help them figure out what it is that they want, and they go, "Oh, I want to hold a puppy," then in that moment they're already there. So you can do it through anchoring, you can do it through uh, uh, repetition. You can uh, there's, uh, most of the time I'll use uh, an anchoring process, which is to bring them right back to that place, and, and just to literally just go, "Okay, calm down right now," and what do you really want? And they'll, and they'll go, and then we'll do it again, we'll do it again. I mean, that, the, uh, again, there's so much more to it, and I'm certainly not doing uh, uh, justice by saying, you know, you just do these, these certain things. There's, yeah. there's a, quite a bit more to it, but... Uh. I'm not gonna say I have bad mood. What I have is, um, I'm human. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're <laughs> yeah. Truly? True, yes, yes, contrary <laughs> to popular belief. Um, <clears throat> Gosh, I have times when there are a lot of things that will happen. I'll give you an example. Here's what I would consider what you might call a bad mood. Um, um, something stressful will happen. Yeah. Perfect example. Okay. I, uh, so I'll say yes. However, mine are extremely, extremely short habitually now. And that's what we want. I'm not saying that... This is my second question. How do you shift it? <laughs> I, I, well, because of what I've done a process that I've done, several processes. One, one in particular, something I call the stop technique, which is uh, one of the things that we teach at our seminars, is which is to replace um, a, a bad emotion, uh, may a re maybe a reoccurring uh, emotion, fear, anger, frustration, uh, whatever, with a, with a great uh, emotion, and make it so that the bad emotion or something that happens triggers you to feel good. And I'll give you an example of how it works. It's just a, so, it's a long process, but uh, too long for us to explain here, but I'll give you an example of the end result. I was just in Italy uh, three weeks ago, and we, my my promoter and business partner and I, had to fly to um, uh, London, and so the car picked us up at the hotel in Italy, drove us an hour and a half to the airport, 
got out of the car, went through security, went to go through passport uh, check, and I realized I didn't have my phone. I left my phone in the car. And in that moment, I was in a bad mood. <laughs> in that moment, I panicked. I'm in a foreign country. My, my, my business partner had already gone through the line. He was already on the other side. And I had no way, and for a second, it's just like, I got no phone. And it's like, <laughs> you know, have you, really, have you ever lost your phone? Yes. Yeah, it's like, <gasps> for a second. But then within, seriously, 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds of panicking, my brain went, hey, well now I get to get an iPhone 5. <laughs> and that's how quickly I got in a good mood. And I use that as an example because, I mean, that's pretty serious stuff, losing your phone. And, and what I'm saying is that's a result of what I teach. Yeah. Because I, I believe I gotta, I can't teach theory. I've got to practice what I preach. And I wasn't. I'm not saying I was ecstatic about it. I was happy about it. But one of the things that I did, I went, hey, well, I get because I was in a better mood now. But then I got, then my brain started to work. And instead of worrying about it and starting to go, my brain started going, okay, well, what do I do? And so I went into the the uh, lounge, and I send an email to my business partner. Uh, and and he, I know he looks at his emails on his phone, and it, and he he uh, uh, called the taxi company, and um, it, they were too far gone, so they uh, they found that he got the phone, and then they overnighted it to us to the next destination. So not only did I feel better, but you know I, I got to think clearer, and and I don't have that that worry and that stress. Great. It's one of the things that we teach at one of our workshops called the A Factor, uh, which is uh, what I call emotional mechanics, which is a way to um, manage your own emotions. Manage meaning uh, uh, to predetermine what you, your response is. And a response is different than a reaction. A reaction is no thought. Response is you think about it, you know, even if it's for a second. So, so predetermine what your response is going to be to anything that happens. So therefore, when bad things happen, or unfortunate things happen, or things happen that are undesirable, you know what your response is going to be. Like I said, on stage, for me, for most people, they go, you gotta go in front of, you know, 10,000 people. Most people go, oh, oh, no. For me, it's just like, cool. And I literally get, I feel it right now. I, I literally get calmed down because I've conditioned myself to be that way. And it's a, it's a very simple tool. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> You are right now. Yeah, but you are right now. how is the people can be, can get happy now? Get the book and read it. Number one, <laughs> and number two, do what's in the book. I, I wrote the book with specific things to do in the book, but I but because we're on camera, I'll tell you a couple things. First off, everybody, it, it, happiness is not the goal. Happiness is the journey. Yeah. Okay. It's not I'm going to work really hard and then I'm going to be happy. That's recipe for disaster. And everybody has their own brand of happiness. And it can be used in many, many aspects of our lives. You know, I do a lot of business training. And businesses bring me in because they want to help for themselves and for their, their, their teams to be more effective. More effective at, at what they do, if it's making something, or typing something, or searching something, or sales, or whatever it is. They want to be more effective. But it's still the same thing. They're not effective because they're not in what I call the zone. The zone is, and I work with sports figures and, and, and people from all walks of life. And, and so I'll use a, a sports example as an example. When you, when you work with somebody, say like a basketball player or a golfer or something like that, they always say the same thing. Yeah, when I'm in the zone, I know everything else, nothing else matters. I'm, I'm focused on this and everything slows down and it's, that's called being happy. You know, the example I like to use is, when I grew up, I was quite a lazy kid. You know, just, I just was. I didn't do, I didn't like to do my homework. I didn't like to do my chores. The, the, you know, I was just lazy. And I hated with a passion to get up early in the morning. School days, forget it. It was just horrible. That I look back on it now, but it was just how I was as a kid. But, 
I used to love to go fishing. We grew up in Hawaii, and I loved to go fishing. I couldn't tell you what seven times seven was. I couldn't tell you what any of my multiplication, but if you asked me what kind of fish that was, or what it ate, or where it lived, I could tell you everything. If I knew I was gonna go fishing the next morning, I'd get my work done, I'd get my homework done, and I'd get up at 4.30 in the morning while it was dark outside with no alarm clock, because I was happy. That level of happiness. And all I'm saying now is, everybody has that in their lives in many, many different things. Even if it is, you know, relaxing or watching television, you have an area of your life that if money and time were no object, you do it all the time. And so through the neurosciences and something called neuroplasticity, meaning how our brain is flexible, to take that same emotion called happiness and put it in the areas where you're not affected. In other words, salespeople have a fear of rejection. What if you can take that place where they have no fear and put it in there? And I just call happiness, it's, it's different for everybody, but most people don't know what it is. If I ask a hundred people, what is it that makes you happy? They always go like this. Well, my kids make, no. Um, <laughs> I like to ride my motorcycle. And they guess at it, which means they don't know. They're not, it's not right on the tip of their tongue. When they, and, and again, I'm not trying to sell books, but when you read the book, you get the opportunity to list it and put it down exactly what it is, and now we have a menu to go to. So when they go, what does my happy? Well, my children make me happy. I like to go skiing. I love to do, you know, be with my wife or my husband. I love to, you know, shoot, shoot a bow and arrow. And they got all that stuff right there, but as they seek it and as they think about it, they feel it. And that's the important part, is for people to recognize that getting happy now is as simple as thinking about what it is that makes you happy. You're happy right now. And anybody can do it. I always jokingly say that I don't care how bad a mood you're in, how depressed you are, if you value money and I give you a million dollars, you're going to get happy. And you're going to go, whoa, thanks. You're not going to be sad anymore. So getting happy now is not really the question. It's getting happy, staying happy long enough to do a process so that the happiness becomes your default. What I just told you about the phone is because I'm happy. I was happy. It's just like I got to, well, I get to get a new iPhone because I haven't had a reason to get an iPhone 5. You know, so I love my iPhone 4. Here's the reason, I'm going to tell you why, and then I'm going to tell you what to do. Here's the reason why. It's because you didn't set what the next thing is. In other words, you know, the old, the, the old example is when the men that went to the moon when they came back to Earth, most of them got depressed. Because what do you do after you've gone to the moon? <laughs> you know? <laughs> what makes people happy is what you're going to get, what's going to happen, what you're looking forward to. Remember, it's the journey, it's not what you get. So you're going, I got my goal and I'm not happy. Well, proof, it's not the goal that makes you happy. It's yeah. the achieving the goal. So, so that's why, but here's what you do to change it. What's next for you? What's the next greatest thing? You know, you shared with me before, you've got all this stuff and now you're gonna take all this information from all these wonderful people that, that you've gotten all this information from and you're gonna put it in a, a place where other people can access it. What do you think about that? How do you feel about that? How do you feel yeah. about when that's done? Yeah, happy. Yeah, look at you. you. Your eyes went up like that and you got happy, <laughs> okay? That's what you're after. So, so the key to it is, and then by the way, that's gonna come to fruition too. There's gonna be a day when that's done. So instead of waiting next time till that's done, plan something ahead of it. I, I said this, I was in uh, Finland, uh, uh, I was in a whole Europe tour about uh, three weeks ago, and I was in Finland and uh, they kind of asked me the same question. And I said, well, I set myself up to feel happy all the time. You know, as I said before, I'm a musician and, and still love to play music. And one of my favorite instruments is bass guitar. And so <laughs> uh, last year, actually the year before last, I said, well, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna complete my collection. And there were four new bass guitars that I wanted. And people go, well, why do you need more than one? Well, why do you need more than one pair of shoes? <laughs> you know, you need them. So instead of going and getting, and they're, they're very expensive, they're very, very rare, and they're custom made. So instead of going, make me these four basses, what I said was, make me one, and they take a year to be made. So I ordered all four, I actually ordered three of them, uh, and, but I had them delivered, one was a year, and then another one was six months after that, another one six months after that, and then I just ordered one, just a little, the last one, and it's gonna be done uh, six months from now. 
So guess what? <laughs> For two years, I get to go, I get to get another base. I get to get another base. And as silly as that sounds, I'm happy. And in the back of my mind, it's going. I, you know, that's what I'm going towards. And people can do that. You don't have to get a base or anything expensive. You can go, you know, I'm going to, uh, whatever it is that you want, place it in your subconscious mind that you're going to get that, that you're just going to go after. Put the carrot on the stick and you're going to, it's, a, it's one way of keeping an undercurrent of happiness because it's an expectation of something wonderful happening. So instead of waiting till you get this goal of having all this information in this site and so on, what's after that? What's after that? And keep it going. Uh, life lessons. I have these simple rules, if you will. I shouldn't say they're rules. They're kind of... I, I mean, I, I've got lots of life lessons. Yeah, I see. So. Yeah, like, like, don't pull into a dark parking lot at night no matter what <laughs> when there's three ugly guys ready to kick your butt. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a life lesson. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 I guess maybe I, I'll answer your question this way. I'll say I have some very, very basic life advice, uh, and they are... Live, love, laugh, learn, and lighten the heck up. <laughs> and what that means is you're on this planet to live. You're not here to, and live doesn't mean sitting down watching television, or as I call it, the electronic income reducer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, live means get out and live your life. You only got one of them. Move your body, interact with other people, do things. Do things, you know, from the very question, the first question that you asked me about the book, and what I learned in the book was to do. You know, don't just learn, don't just sit and do, you do something, interact. So live your life. Love, we already talked about that. Love yourself, love as many people as you possibly can. It's what we're here for. Love is happiness. It's, it, it's what makes us human beings, us human beings. It's what we're all after. Find a way to do as much of it as you possibly can. Laugh for all of the right reasons, meaning when we laugh, we're healthier, you know, we're happier, it, it makes the blood flow, we breathe better and all those things, laugh as much as possible, you know, we create the energy, we attract more and all those things. Um, learn, always be a student. To this day, I still spend you know, a lot of money on seminars, and workshops, and books, and, and recordings, and things like that, because learning is, the, the day you stop learning is the day you start going the other direction. You know, and learning again does not mean sitting in front of the television and watching a sitcom or some other, you know, show. I'm not knocking them, but be you know, use it in moderation. Learn stuff. You should be learning something every day. At the end of the day, you should say, "What did I learn?" And you should go back over it. You should you should go back and go, well, "This is what I learned." The the mind is the most unbelievable computer, and it's got endless storage. And you know, when you look at people that are you know, I study now. People that are in their hundreds, and you know, I, I met somebody who was 107 years old, sharp as a tack. And and I asked, what makes you so sharp? As opposed to, I see 60, 70 year old people who are just they're done, you know, they're going through it. And he goes, they always say the same thing, because I learn, because I'm always growing, because I'm always curious. So learn. Um, and the last last thing is lighten up. Light, you know, don't take everything so serious. You know, it's just like we. I said this, uh, I was doing another interview uh, a few weeks ago, and they said, well, what do, you, what do you have to say about all this violence that's going on and, and, uh, and everything? <laughs> and I said, well, first off, what, are we, what did we expect? We have spoon-fed three generations of children violence and video games and, and videos and movies and, and so on and so forth, and we've taught them that the most important thing is to care about only yourself and all those things, and so this is the result. But this, that's the result of all of that, but it doesn't have to stay that way. And what I mean by that is, is it's, it's honestly time for, for people to go and just relax. It's going to be okay. Sun is, I guarantee you, whoever's watching this right now, I promise you, the sun is going to come up tomorrow. Well, if you're in, in the UK, it might not, you might not see it, but it's going to be up there. <laughs> but it's, you know, lighten up. It's going to be okay. Whenever, whenever you're most stressed, Stop and take a deep breath and just say to yourself, it's all going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And lighten up. Don't have to take things so serious. Yeah. Live, love, laugh, learn, and lighten up. Do it to, to do that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Turn on the television, play video games, and just do nothing.
Mm, nothing. Keep a closed mind. All the things that I said before. Yeah. You have, you have, don't have fun. Have a closed mind. Do not allow yourself to learn. Do not allow somebody to push you. Be, don't allow yourself to be uncomfortable. Stay complacent, and you will become a loser. Period. Great. And oh, give up. <laughs> Stop. The amount of people that fail is directly proportionate to the amount of people who give up. So you have to learn to give up. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, we're being taught it every single day, you know. But that's that's my answer. <laughs>